I don't know about you, but I've really been enjoying these studies in Joshua and these sermons the last couple of weeks. I've enjoyed preparing them, and I hope and pray that God has used them to richly bless you. In, John, in Joshua chapter 5, beginning in verse 13, let me kind of get you, give you the background, the setting. The children of Israel have already crossed over the Jordan. They're camped at Gilgal. They celebrate the Passover, and the minute they celebrate the Passover and begin to eat produce from the land, the manna that God has been providing for 40 years has now stopped. So behind them, they've got the Jordan River. In front of them, they have the city of Jericho, a highly fortified city. And I'm sure Joshua must have wondered, how in the world are we ever going to be able to uh, win the victory over uh, that particular city? And so that's the context. And in verse 13 of chapter 5, when Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and he looked. And behold, a man was standing before him with a drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, No, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said, Joshua, take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Now Jericho was shut up inside and outside because of the people of Israel, None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with the king and the mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all the men of war going around the city once. Thus shall you do for six days. Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. On the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priest will blow the trumpets. And when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout. And the wall of the city will fall down flat. And the people shall go up, everyone straight before him. And so Joshua followed the Lord's instructions. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you that it is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Lord, you do not change, and your word does not change. Your standards have not changed. Lord, we come to open our lives up to your word, to let you speak to us. Father, I pray that our hearts will be transformed today by the power of your Holy Spirit, who is our teacher and our guide. Lord, I pray that uh, we will get great excitement out of this particular passage of Scripture but Father, more than just being excited, I pray that it will literally change our hearts and our lives. Lord, I pray that and I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. A 30-year-old Mississippi resident was convicted of drunk driving. The judge, being a gracious man that he was, uh, convicted him and sentenced him to 15 years. But he told him, that uh, he would suspend 14 years of that sentence if the man would just remain under house arrest for one year. So all the man needed to do was to be obedient for one year, and after that, uh, he would be free. Well, the man stayed home for a while, but finally he got bored sitting at home, tired of being isolated. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Uh, he got tired of being isolated, and so he decided he was going fishing. So he loaded up his truck and he got in there and drove, of course, on a suspended license to go fishing. Sure enough, the police called him. He was out and he was thrown in jail. His disobedience cost him his freedom. In Joshua chapters 5 and 6, God tells us why he wants us to be obedient to his word. It's because obedience leads to victory. You and I need to be obedient to God. Joshua was leading a bunch of people, a bunch of ragtag 
slaves that had been in the desert for 40 years. They didn't have any armaments. They didn't have any weapons. Uh, there was really no way that Joshua, I'm sure, could even begin to think about a plan of battle that would overcome the city of Jericho. But God had a plan. And God's plan of battle is the craziest plan of battle I've ever heard of. I'm sure when Joshua told this to his fighting men, they must have looked at Joshua and said, you are absolutely out of your mind. But the only way that they would gain victory over that city, the only way they would gain victory was to be obedient to the voice of the Lord. What about us? God has given us his word. He's told us that these words written in the scriptures are our life. They're our well-being. They lead to joy. Uh, they lead to us loving God. In fact, the Bible says if we love the Lord, we will keep his commandments. But the question is, are we obedient to God? Why does God want us to be obedient? Because obedience always leads to victory. So what insights can we gain from this particular passage of Scripture that can help us experience victory in our own lives? Notice, first of all, the person is more important than the plan. The person is more important than the plan. Now, God had already promised back in Joshua chapter 1, he told, him three, God, Joshua told, he told Joshua three times, I will not leave you and I will not forsake you. I will be with you. Just as I was with Moses, I will be with you. God also in that first chapter of Joshua told Joshua, I have already given the land of Canaan unto my people, unto the people of God. All you've got to do is to go up and take possession of it. And so as Joshua is wandering around, I no doubt trying to come up with, Lord, what is it you want me to do? How is it you want me to lead your people to defeat the city of Jericho? Somebody showed up. He sees a man standing with a drawn sword in his hand. Now, one of two things is true. Either this man was an adversary at which point Joshua was going to pull his sword and they were going to enter into battle right there. Or it was one of Joshua's men, and if he'd, drawn, if he'd drawn the sword, then Joshua was going to have to have a conversation with him because Joshua had not given the order that anybody should draw a sword. But when Joshua gets there, he learns that it is the commander of the Lord's army that's standing before him. Now, who's the commander of the Lord's army? Well, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Joshua must have realized this because he bows down in worship to God. Now, when God shows up, when the Lord Jesus Christ shows up, it's not for him to be a spectator. The battle belongs to the Lord. He was in charge of it. And that's exactly what Jesus said. He said, I'm the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. I'm here for this. I'm here for this battle. I'm here to lead you in to battle. Our Lord always comes to us when we face life's difficult moments. He always comes to us when we go through battles. And the key for our success is for us to trust Him. We need to remind ourselves constantly, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge, as God's Word tells us in Psalm 46. Joshua must have been greatly encouraged when the Lord Jesus Christ shows up. And I'm sure that he was ready for the battle plan. He'd been scratching his head for a couple of days now, and he was ready to hear what God had to say to him. And when Joshua falls down on his face, he asks the Lord a question. He says, my Lord, what do you say to your servant? In other words, Lord, give me some instructions about what I'm supposed to do. Notice the thing that the Lord tells him to do. He doesn't give him the plan of battle first, does he? He says, take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. To remove one's sandal was to an indication, a symbol of, of a person's unworthiness, and it was also a symbol of worship. Joshua, 
was standing in the presence of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Notice this is not an angel. You know, a lot of times in the scripture, when a person tries to give worship to an angel, the angel will pick that person up and say, look, I'm not worthy of being worshipped. There's only one that's worthy of being worshipped. The fact that Jesus told Joshua to take his sandals off meant that he was indeed Jesus Christ, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Notice the most important thing was not a battle plan. The most important thing was for Joshua to fall down and worship before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Joshua needed to get his priorities straight. He needed to worship. Let me ask you a question. During all this lockdown, during all this time that you've been away from uh, the Lord's house, not being able to come inside and worship him, what are you doing to make worship a priority in your own life? The Bible is clear that we are to worship the King of kings and Lord of lords. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Are you making sure that you're putting God first in your life? Have, have your daily devotionals taking on a, a new love in your heart, a new passion for you as you have sought out the face of God? I pray and hope that it has. One of the things that you and I need to learn when we are in the battle is that the battle is not ours. It belongs to the Lord. And what you and I need to do is to worship the Lord first and foremost. And secondly, we need to listen to his instructions. We need to trust his leadership and guidance. After all, Jesus Christ, you remember what he told us when he was here? He said, look at the birds of the air that they do not sow or reap. Or store away in barns, let yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? And Jesus goes on to remind us of what our responsibility is. We are to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things. And he's talked about food and clothing and housing and all those things that are important to us. He says all of these things will be added unto you. God's promises are way too numerous to mention in one sermon. But the great news is God promises victory to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Secondly, the second insight that we can gain from this particular passage of scripture that we've read today is that obedience is the key to victory. Jer Jericho was not going to be easily taken. It had been tightly shut up according to what the scripture said. A double ring of walls, an outer wall of si that was six feet thick, and an inner wall that was 12 foot thick fortified the city of Jericho. Jericho was built, it was an oasis in the middle of a desert-like condition. It was built on the foothills of the Judean mountains. The only way that Joshua could proceed to take the land was to go through Jericho. If he tried to bypass Jericho, he would put his army at risk because Jericho was powerful enough they could attack them from the rear. Jericho was built upon a mound, and so you had to go up a steep incline to even get to the city. Typically, when you found a walled city like that, what people would do is they would set up siege around the city and close it up so that nobody could come in or out so that literally the people would starve to death and when they got to the point of starvation when all the food ran out, they would simply surrender to the army that was outside. But that's not God's plan for God's people. What was God's plan? Well, Jesus told Joshua very simply, I'll, Joshua, I want you I want the men of battle, the men of war, in other words, the Israel army. I want the priest who will be blowing on ram's horns. And I want the Levites to carry the ark. And I want you to march around the wall one time every day for six days. On the seventh day, you are to get up and you are to march around the wall seven times. And then... There's going to, the, the priests are going to blow a long uh, blow on the trumpet and the people are going to give a great shout and the walls are going to fall down. Now, now picture yourself for just a minute. 
You're in the army of Israel. You've already fought a number of battles on the other side of the Jordan. Uh, you've gone in. You've had to use weapons of war. You've had to go in to defeat armies. And your commander is now telling you, the only thing I want you to do for six day, for seven days is march around the walls. And you're not to shoot the first arrow. You're to be quiet until I tell you to shout. Can, can you imagine? They must have thought, how foolish can you be, Joshua? Those walls just aren't going to fall down by themselves. I, I know people, and I know how people are. I'm sure they mumbled and grumbled every day when they got up. Got to go walk around that goofy wall all over again for a whole day. Nothing's going to happen. What a, what a crazy plan this is. This will never work. Those people were known for mumbling and grumbling, weren't they? They mumbled and grumbled all the time. You know that didn't change any when Joshua gave the command for them to march around the wall for seven days. I'm sure they thought about, man, it's hot and it's dusty out here. Can we not just go stay in our tent and have a long nap and not worry about this? They walked around the walls. What were the trumpets all about? Well, well I'm glad you asked. The, the word that's used here for the trumpets are the jubilee trumpets. And the jubilee trumpets were used in connection with Israel's solemn feast days. And the sounding of the trumpet was to proclaim the presence of God in the midst of his people. So those six days, as they're marching around the wall and the, and the priests are blowing the trumpets every day, it's signaling to everybody, especially to God's people, that God is there. God's presence is there. God is with them. Of course, Jesus has already told Joshua that. He said, I, that's the reason I came. The battle is mine. And so the people knew that according to the blowing of the trumpets, God was in their midst. I'm sure again that the people of battle must have wondered, man, what kind of crazy idea is this? These people were a rebellious people. In fact, in my devotional time yesterday, I was reading and uh, God had to remind Ezekiel just how rebellious the children of Israel were. He says, son of man, in Ezekiel chapter 12, verse 2, he says, son of man, you dwell in the midst of a rebellious house, which have eyes to see and see not. They have ears to hear and hear not. For they are a rebellious house. In many ways, you and I are just like this. I, I see so many Christians who want Jesus to be Savior of their life, but they do not want Jesus to be Lord of their life. But here's the truth. The only way we're going to experience God, God's victory is when you and I do what God asks us to do. When we obey the voice of God, they had to trust and obey as we sang about earlier. James Hudson Taylor was a great missionary in China. He was the founder of the China Inland Mission, which now is known as the Overseas Missionary Fellowship. He, in talking and having conversations with his missionaries, made this observation. There's really three ways that you can carry on your missionary work. The first is to design a plan and to carry out that plan in your own strength. The second way is to design a plan to reach the lost. Ask God to bless your plans and then go on. Third, which he said was the best way of working, is to get along with God and let God tell you what his plan was for reaching this people and then do exactly what God has told you to do. In order for the Israelites, to be successful, they had to follow God's law to the letter. They had to do exactly what God had told them to do. Guys, nothing is too difficult for God. God is all-powerful. In fact, we need to learn that nothing is too great for God. We need to remind ourselves what God said to Zerubbabel in, in Zechariah chapter 4, 6. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Our God is all powerful and he can accomplish his purposes and plans without your help or mine. Our responsibility is to be obedient to him and to do what he asks. Failure to respond to God in obedience would admit the certain defeat of the children of Israel. Where would they have gone after that point? What would they have done? 
They'd been wandering for 40 years only to get to the promised land. Had they been unwilling to be obedient to God, what would have happened to them? Obedience in the face of impossible odds, though, resulted in great victory. Let me ask another question. Why did God not make the walls fall down the minute they started marching around the walls? Maybe God wanted to be sure if they were going to be obedient to what he asked them to do. You know, we pray about things sometimes and we want God to answer us immediately. God wants us to persevere in prayer. He wants us to persevere in, in holding on to his will and doing things his way. I know what my tendency is. I pray about something if the Lord doesn't answer in five minutes, then I'm trying to finagle something to get it to work out the way I want it to anyway. I wonder how many times we do that and we miss the blessings of God because we don't wait on the Lord and we don't persevere in prayer and we don't follow his plan exactly as he's laid it out for us. God will provide victory in our lives if you and I will be careful to do exactly what he tells us to do. Now that, that may mean the victory won't look exactly like what we think it ought to look like, but it'll be God's victory. And God will receive the glory and the honor that he rightly deserves. Well, on the seventh day, the people marched around. They got up early that particular morning. They marched around the wall seven times uh, as the, tr the priests were blowing the trumpets. But then there was a great long uh, blast on the trumpet and the people shouted. And I picture in my mind, you remember Jesus, the captain of the Lord's army? I can picture the Lord's army, angels. As they stomp the walls flat, I can just see them all flying down from heaven at the same time, picking out a spot on the wall, and every one of them hit that wall, and that wall fell flat on the ground. By the way, I, as I was reading this this week, I, I read some archaeological evidence. They have discovered literally how the walls, a uh, place in Jericho where the walls collapsed, just like we're talking about. They fell straight down. There's archaeological evidence that show that to be true. What made their victory so complete? Their victory was so complete because of their dependence and their obedience to God and his word. If you and I depend on human beings, even ourselves, we get what only human beings can do. But if we will depend on God, the victory will be complete and we'll see God do great and mighty things. Listen to what God told Jeremiah the prophet as or Jeremiah the prophet is telling uh, to God's people, this is the word of the Lord. He says, thus says the Lord, cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is like a shrub in the desert and shall not see good. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness. Could it be right now that your life is parched? Because you're not listening to the voice of God and you're not being obedient to him. You're simply trying to do things on your own. But God goes on to say, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. Whose trust is totally and completely in the Lord. He's like a tree that's planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. And does not fear when the heat comes. For it leaves, its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought. For it does not cease to bear fruit. Is your heart anxious today? Is it? Is your heart anxious about what you see going on in the world today? Let me just encourage you. Trust in the Lord. Those who trust in the Lord, they're like a, a well-watered garden that puts its roots deep. And it doesn't matter when July heat comes like we're experiencing today. It doesn't matter because... The roots are down deep into the waters, and the waters feed him. You know, the convicted felon that I mentioned in the beginning of this sermon, all he had to do was to be obedient for one year. Stay at home for one year, that's all he had to do. To escape 15 years in prison. And he couldn't do it. He couldn't simply be obedient to what he was asked to do. His failure to obey brought about his defeat. Why should we obey God? It is because obedience leads to victory. 
And I don't care what obstacles you're facing right now. God is all powerful. Nothing you have faced in your past, nothing that you're going to face today, and nothing that you're going to face in the future is more powerful than God. I encourage you, listen to his voice. Would you like to experience victory in your life? There's only one way to victory. And that's listening to the voice of God and obeying the voice of God. And what does that mean? Well, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the first thing you need to do is to submit your life to his lordship. The Bible says if you will confess Jesus as Lord, you shall be saved. In other words, if you're willing to submit your life to the lordship of Jesus Christ, you can be born again. You can have the spirit of God coming inside you and you can experience the victory that God has prepared for you. You must confess and admit that you're a sinner before God, that that sin has separated you from God. You must understand that Jesus took your sin upon himself at the cross and paid the penalty of your sins that you might be forgiven. And then you must accept him into your life as your Lord and your Savior. If you'll do that today, you'll experience the greatest joy and the peace that passes all understanding. You don't have to have a preacher to do that. You can do that right out there in your car, where you are, wherever you are listening to this message. Just bow your head and say, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Lord, I have faith and trust in you that Jesus Christ paid the penalty of my sins, and I invite him to come into my life to be my Lord and my Savior. The Bible says if you do that sincerely with, with your heart and from your heart, not just with your head, if you do that sincerely from your heart, you shall be saved. That's the first step of obedience. The second one is to obey everything that, that Christ has commanded. That means you need to study God's word to move forward. For every believer who's here today, do you want to experience victory in your life on a daily basis? Then quit trusting in yourself. Trust in God. Trust in His power. Allow Him to be the Lord of your life. Quit trying to take the steering wheel out of God's hand and run it your own way. I encourage you to stay. Whatever the Holy Spirit has convicted you about, you need to answer the Lord today. And I pray that you'll do that. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for life that's ours today. We thank you for this wonderful example of victory because a people, a hard-headed, stubborn people followed exactly what you asked them to do. Lord, they didn't understand it, I know. Lord, I'm sure they complained about it, and yet, Lord, they got up and did what you asked them to do. Lord, may we be more like them every day. Lord, may we honor you with our lives. May we submit to your lordship every day of our life so that we can experience the victory that you have prepared for us in Christ Jesus. Lord, may we share this message with others around us. Lord, I pray that and I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you give me just a second, I will get our offering receptacle ready and you'll be able to drive through and put your offering and, uh, in that receptacle. And I pray that you'll honor the Lord uh, with uh, your first fruits. Uh, the Bible says the tithe belongs to the Lord. Uh, but we also are to give joyfully and cheerfully. And it's such a great way to be able to worship God.